Jesus took the consequence as if he lived your life. And he gave you the freedom as if you lived his life. Jesus took death as if he told your lie. And he gave you the freedom and eternal life as if you lived his perfect life. This is called the substitution of the gospel. Listen, my dad was raised in a non-Christian home. It was fighting, it was broken, uh, the marriage was struggling, it wasn't gonna last. He was raised by high school dropouts. It was a struggling situation in the streets of Baltimore, Maryland where the word statistic derives its meaning. It was tough. He was raised by my grandparents. We call them two daddy and two mama. Some of you have heard that name before, but if you haven't, it's our second set of grandparents. So we called them two mama and two daddy. If you like that, you can steal it, no problem. Two daddy was a longshoreman. And so they were so poor that he would just, as a job, he would just load and unload boats and he would fish at night while he was at work to get his family food. And so my dad would eat fish almost for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, that was the life that he was living. And he was living that life broken in so many areas. Financially, again, the marriage was broken. The family situation was broken. The streets that he lived on were broken. Everything was broken. One day when Two Daddy was at work, two men came up to him and asked him if he had ever gone to church before. Two Daddy said, uh, maybe I have once or twice. And then they responded and said, will you come to church with us? Two men. And Two Daddy said, yeah, I don't have anything else to do. So Two Daddy went to church one day. This was 62 years ago that Two Daddy went to church, invited by those two men. And they went to church and they had a good church service. And then after the church service, the two men asked Two Daddy, did you like it? What did you think about it? And Two Daddy said, it was fine. It was fun. I learned something new. And then they asked him another question. They said, well, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And Two Daddy said, I don't know. I don't even know anything about that. Well, I don't even know what y'all are talking about. And they went on to explain to Two Daddy, my grandfather, my dad's dad, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Two Daddy that day, after going to church with those two men who invited him, accepted Jesus Christ. He came home a different man. And if Two Mama was still here, she'd tell you, uh, I didn't like him as a sinner and I hated him as a saint, to be honest with you. I mean, things didn't change just because he changed when he came home. Things were pretty much the same. It was a struggle. Two Daddy had to read his Bible at midnight to try to get some peace. And so for a year, this went on. It was a struggle. He was suffering, but he was still a saint. He was still trying to learn his new faith, the gospel that was preached to him, and he was still trying to get, put all the pieces together. So for a year, he read his Bible at midnight just to try to get to know the new faith that he had. Around about day 367, two mama came downstairs with tears in her eyes. Two daddy thought to himself, oh no, here we go again, here she comes. But this time was different because two mama said the more I hate you, the more you love me. The more I reject you, the more you accept me. This Jesus thing must be real. How can I have it too? So Two Daddy, after studying for a year, was able to properly, adequately, and accurately give the gospel to Two Mama. They both got excited, woke the kids up, my dad being the oldest of four, and brought them downstairs at 1 a.m. and they shared the gospel with them. And my dad and his siblings accepted Jesus Christ. My dad became the first in our family to, grow to graduate high school, go to college, uh, became the first African-American, as many of you know, to graduate with a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary, started a church with 10 people in a house that became 10,000 members, a radio broadcast that's heard all over the world. Uh, he was the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys in the Tom Landry days, the chaplain of the Mavericks since their conception as an organization, had four kids, I'm one of them, baby of the family, best position in the house, by the way that are all in ministry, serving God to the best of our ability. And now we have children uh, that are actually participating in ministry with me. My children are participating in ministry with me. It's four generations of a totally different trajectory. Four generations where two daddy and two mama were able to look out from, from their porch years and years later at their children's children's children. Amazing, the trajectory that changes. I didn't tell you that story to tell you about my children, I didn't tell you that story to tell you about my siblings and, I, and myself. I didn't tell you that story to tell you about Tony and Lois Evans. I didn't even tell you that story to tell you about two mom and two daddy. I told you that story to tell you about two men that I've never met. I told you that whole story to tell you about two men. I never know their faces and I'll never know their names. I told you that story to tell you about two men who were unashamed one day. 
And because they lived an unashamed life and witnessed to my two daddy, who brought it home to my two, two mama, who woke my dad up and his siblings, I'm here to tell you this story. The trajectory of four generations changed 62 years ago because two men were unashamed. You don't think that you can have impact by being unashamed of the gospel? We're unashamed about a lot of things. We're unashamed about our social media accounts. We're unashamed about certain lifestyles that we shouldn't be living. We're unashamed about how we talk. We're unashamed about how we poorly treat people. We're unashamed about a whole lot of things. We just say it is what it is. This is what I do. But how about not being unashamed of the gospel that actually has a spiritual trajectory that means something? That these two men, they never knew. They never knew what impact the gospel had on that one unashamed day. They never knew that four generations later would be totally different because of what they said on one Sunday, but they were unashamed. And Paul says the same thing that you and I need to consider. In Romans 1.16, he says, For I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe, first to the Jews, then to the, then to the Greeks. He says, I am unashamed of the gospel. In verse 15 of Romans chapter 1, he says, I'm eager to preach the gospel. He's not just saying I'm unashamed. He's saying I'm proud. <laughs> I'm proud of the gospel. How can we be unashamed of something that gives us love, something that gives us life, something that gives us mercy, something that gives us grace, something that gives us eternity, something that gives us abundant life now? How can we be ashamed of something like that? Moreover, how can we not be proud of it? And you know you're proud of something because you share it. You show it. It motivates your movement. People know you by it. What do people know you for? Do they just know you for your business? Do they just know you for your social media account? Do they just know you for your songs and your dance? Do they just know you for what you promote out in the world or the drip that you have or the way that you carry yourselves or the car that you buy or the house that you live in? Like, what are you known for? Because whatever you're known for is actually what you're unashamed of. It's actually what you're proud of. Many of us are known for gossip, not the gospel. <laughs> And many of us are known for being that hot girl, that hot guy, but we ain't known for the gospel. And many of us may be known for playing games and being a part of gimmicks, but we ain't known for the gospel. You may be known for the grind for the money, but you ain't known for the gospel of the Messiah. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, ladies. That's why we're here. Paul says, I am unashamed of the gospel. Maybe you don't really understand it. Maybe it slipped you. One of the greatest gospel verses in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, God made him who knew no sin, become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. I don't know if you heard that. He, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. This is called substitutionary atonement. Basically, you're on death row. The security guard comes and he unlocks it to take you down to lethal injection because of what you've done and deservingly you should be there and I should be there. We lay on the table, he straps us down to give us the death that we deserve. And right before the lethal injection goes into your arm, someone knocks on the door. That someone knocks on the door and that person who knocks on the door is not supposed to be in the jail. That person who knocked on the door has not made any mistakes. That person who knocked on the door is actually perfect. That person who knocks on the door should be nowhere near the jail, let alone the lethal injection room. But he comes into the room and he unstraps you by his grace and unstraps you by his mercy. He pulls you off to the table and doesn't just take you out of the lethal injection room, he sends you totally out of the jail, giving you justification to say that you are not guilty even though you are guilty. And then he lays on that table that you were supposed to be on. He straps himself to it and allows himself to take the lethal injection. He allows himself to be injected with the syringe of death that he should have never been injected with based on the life that he lived. And now you're free. Now you're outside of the jail. You went from the table to the dinner table. You went from the lethal injection table to being able to actually have a life more abundantly outside of the jail completely because someone who was perfect took your place on the table and took death on your behalf so that you might have life. In other words, let me say it simple. <laughs> Jesus took the consequence as if he lived your life and he gave you the freedom as if you lived his life. 
Jesus took death as if he told your lie. And he gave you the freedom and eternal life as if you lived his perfect life. This is called the substitution of the gospel. That you should have been on that table and you should have took that lethal syringe. John 11, 25 says, those who believe in me will live even if they die. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he lived a perfect life satisfying God. That he died a death that he should have never died because the wages of sin is death. He never sinned, so why is he paying that wage? Oh, he's the perfect substitute, his grace and his mercy. And then he rose from the dead to let you know that if you believe in me, you will live even if you die. You won't even be dead long enough to know that you died. Why? Because when God sees you, he's going to see the perfection that Jesus Christ gave you. When God sees you, he's going to see that atonement for your sins was already complete. When God sees you, he's going to see that the resurrection has already been done. So all those who are in Christ get to start on a new trajectory. Today, you need to become one of those two men. Today, you need to become one of those two ladies. 62 years ago, our trajectory changed, not just for life, but for eternity. That's the only reason I'm in front of this camera right now. Two men that I've never met, two men that I don't know their names, two men that I'll never meet. I don't even know what they look like, but I'm so thankful that that day they clearly explained the gospel. They were unashamed and they weren't known for gimmicks and games. They were known for the gospel and that's why Jesus knows my name. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord and know that it will not go in vain. What are you known for? What are you proud of? What are you unashamed of? Hopefully it's the gospel. Listen, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, share this message because we are trajectory changers. All right, let's do it together. Let's go. All right, everybody. Listen, this is your boy, Jonathan Evans. Listen, I just gave this message, told you a great story about what happened in my family based on people who are unashamed. And that's what we're called to do as believers. Like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Make sure you become a part of the family and share this video with whoever needs to hear it because we want to make an impact. That's what we're called to do. Let's do it together. Let's go.